This evening, I do have the topic is hope in Christ. Hope in Christ. And that's what we're going to be uh, sharing with you here this morning. And, and how many know that, that if, if there's any a time that, that we need hope in this world, it is now. It is now. We, we need hope like, like probably never before. If you're a young parent and you're raising kids in this world, I'm sure you could say amen to that. Amen to that. More and more parents are looking to try to get their children to be in private schools and, and keep them out of the public school system. And, and children don't walk home or walk to school anymore when sometimes I go pick up my grandchildren and sometimes I'm not able to or I'll be running late and I'll see the, uh, my eighth grader and my fourth grader walking and they're the only ones walking. The only two people walking and I go, man. Man, what a, what a world that we live in where kids can't even walk to and from school. Right here in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, the Bible reads like this. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The spirit of the Lord is on me. And this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ declaring to the people. He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Somebody said, good news to a dying man is that you can live. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, the bruised, the crushed by tragedy, the down, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Amen? And when Jesus came on the scene and, and, and he began to proclaim this message, we know that it was a time where the people there the, were living under oppression. The world that he came into wasn't a perfect world. He came into a world where the Roman Empire was ruling over the people. Amen? He came into a, a place where even the leaders that were appointed by the Romans to govern the people did even sometimes a more treacherous job than the Romans themselves. They were even more ruthless, cruel. King Herod and his sons were, were cruel leaders, murderers. Even uh, they were psychotic and, and paranoid. King Herod was so paranoid at one moment in time when he found out that Jesus was born and people were saying that a new king was born. He got so paranoid that, that he had the people kill all the babies that were born around the time that he thought Christ was to be born within a two-year period. So he had children from two years to babies, newborns. He had them murdered. Because of jealousy. Because he heard there was a new king that was coming on the scene. And he got paranoid. He wanted to be the only king. And can you imagine that is the world that Jesus came into? Madness is the only way you could explain it. There were other leaders, religious leaders called Pharisees and Sadducees, and, and many of them were not much better. Later on, we see that Christ himself rebuked them. He rebuked them and, and said they were hypocrites. He said they were the blind leading the blind, that their spiritual eyes were not even open. 
And he rebuked the Pharisees. He rebuked the Sadducees, the other leaders for being unspiritual rulers. There were other religious groups, the Zealots, the Essens, and other little cliques of religious groups and leaders. The Zealots were a group of people that they were tired of all the the many years and years, hundreds of years of being under oppression. And this group said, man, we're not going to compromise with the Romans. We don't want to be under their thumb. We want our independence. We want to be free. We don't want to be slaves no more. We don't want to be captive no more. We don't want to be oppressed no more. We don't want to be bruised no more. So they went into a, a state of guerrilla warfare. They went underground and began to fight against the Romans and, and wait for the Messiah they, they, they thought was going to lead them to victory to get their country back. Consequently, one of those very men, one of those very zealots, became one of the 12 disciples, simply known as Simon the Zealot. He grew up in a time where there was a shortage of water. The ground was not fertile. Because of that, there were many sicknesses, many diseases. We're finding now that there's so much sickness and disease in our world. We're a sophisticated world, and, and thank God that they're finding cures. They found a, a, a literally a cure for hepatitis C. That's amazing. My wife got the cure for hepatitis C. Some of you know others that got cured from hepatitis C because they found the cure. But they're so many other diseases and sicknesses that even though they're the science and even though they're finding cures and even though they're getting together and finding solutions and, and making people's lives better, whatever disease and sickness they might have, they can't keep up with it. Now, tonight, I want to be sharing this with you and I don't want you to get depressed because it's going to seem a little bit depressing. But we're not going to stay in depression. Amen? I'm not going to leave you in depression. But this is a reality. This is a reality. I mean, it looks good. But the reality is, it's not that good. Because we can't keep up. They're trying to figure out why are there so many sicknesses. Is it the water? Well, the air seems better. I mean, the air seems better to me. When we were kids around here, we couldn't even hardly breathe. We were walking around playing outside like we, I think 100% of us had asthma. You could feel it in your lungs when we were kids. Uh, uh, we were always outside, not like nowadays. The punishment in those days used to be you can't go outside. Oh, my God, that was the worst. Beat me, slap me, whip me, but don't tell me I can't go outside. Man, how things have changed. The punishment now is, you, you know, you can't be inside. You have to go outside. <laughs> That's the punishment. Now go in the backyard for 15 minutes. What am I going to do out there? I don't know. Basketball, baseball, football, kickball. Walk around in the grass, do something. Times have changed. And that's simply just a snapshot of the world that Christ was born into, a world that tried to kill him literally when he was a child, wiped out so many children. John 1.10 said, says, he was in the world... And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. But that's all right, because you know what he did? He went out to the outcasts. He went out to the rejects of society. 
He said, if my own won't receive me, I'm going to go to those that will receive me. I'm going to go to the hurting. I'm going to go to the lost. I'm going to go to the sick. I'm going to go to the afflicted. I'm going to go to the hopeless. I'm going to go to the rejects of society. And that's what he did. He went there. He had a message. He was anointed. He had a message of hope and power and of love and of Jesus Christ. He had a message. He was divinely anointed and appointed to preach and to proclaim this message. And if you notice in, in, you, in the word as you read it, you see that not only did he have a message, he had a heart for the people. He had such compassion. He would numerous times look upon the, the cities and, and he would see the people and he would, he would break for them. He would see like, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. So many times I want to just gather you like a, a, a mother gathers her chicks. He had so much love and compassion for the people. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he heard their cry and he seen their tears. He heard the cry of one Matthew who was a tax collector a man that was a man of means, a man that, that had things. He didn't have very many friends because he was a tax collector. But he had, he was a man of means. And, and I, I could imagine that maybe he felt guilty because in those days, uh, the tax collectors had to do things that were not right. They had to treat people and, and their money in a certain way, and it wasn't right, but Whatever the case may be, maybe he was guilty, maybe he was lonely, but nevertheless, this man was a man that, that Jesus heard his cry. And Matthew became a follower of Christ and, and ended up writing one of the Gospels, the Gospel of Matthew. You know, a week ago when I, I, I was going to preach this message, or I found out I was going to preach this message, it kind of was odd because I had a wild month, not an ordinary month. I had a month where literally one after another of different kinds of people that, that fit this category here, hurting people, you know, people that were the rejects of society, people that, and it just was like, even all last week. It just was one after another. I wouldn't even be able to sit here and tell you of all of them. But I'm going to tell you about some of them. There was a guy that came to me about a month ago. I've known him. Talking to him in the parking lot. I hadn't seen him for a while, so when I seen him, you know, he's a bodybuilder. He's in his 40s. He's in shape. He makes 750000 a year. This year, he's going to make a million. And he's going to keep making more if he keeps doing what he's doing. He's a businessman. And I hadn't seen him, and I seen him, and, and I walk up to him, and I says, hey, you know, you look different. He goes, oh, what do you mean? I go, you just look lonely. He goes, I am lonely. <laughs> this man treated women, like, not very well, but he had as many women as he wanted. He was there in the parking lot in his $150,000 car. And I says, man, you, look, you don't look happy. Yeah, I'm not happy. I go, you look lost. He goes, I am. I'm lost. I'm lost with tears in his eyes. I said, you have all this. I'm looking at his, I don't know, I guess they were snake boots or whatever. I never had a pair of them kind of shoes, but I bet they cost a lot of money. I said, look at you. You got all the women you want. In, in most, a lot of guys' minds, you would seem to have everything that the world could offer. You have, 
You're going to make a million dollars. You're going to keep on going. You have this $150,000 car. You got these shoes on that I don't know what they are. But look at you, man. You got tears in your eyes. You're sad. You're lonely. There's something missing. There was another individual in the Bible in John chapter 4 known as the woman at the well. And Jesus heard her cry. Hey, wait a minute. I told them if they could put the clock up there, but they were doing it in uh, Roman numerals or something. Oh, no, that's the time. So their number's smaller. Okay, we're good. And this woman, known as the woman at the well, Jesus went and approached her at the well, and he began to talk with her. Even those that seen him talk with her began to judge him. They already had judged her. They said, doesn't he know who this woman is that he's talking to? There by himself at the well. He started judging them. And, and Jesus, in his wonderful, non-judgmental way, began to speak to this woman. She was a woman that had five husbands. And he told her that, frankly, that you're a woman that has had five husbands. And even the one that you're going to go home with today is even not your husband. And she was a woman that he's seen that she was looking for something that she was hungry for something, that she was an outcast of society, that people looked down at her, but there was something about her that, that he seen that something was missing inside of her. And he told her, you come to the well, but I could give you a greater well, a well that has living water. If you would only ask me, I would give you water that would last forever. And he spoke to this woman in this matter, manner, no matter the onlookers, the looky-loos, no matter what people thought. Why? Why? Because he had a burden, a compassion for the outcasts. A week and a half ago, I was talking to a young girl, and she's crying out for help, and she's saying, I don't know what to do, about 19 years old. She had bald head on this side, pink hair on this side. She had a puppy. She goes, I don't know what I'm doing. Look, at I even did a Britney Spear hair, she told me. With tears in her eyes, she said, I just broke up with my boyfriend who's way older than me. And I've been in the streets, but he went and found me and he took me to a friend of his so I can stay. And she says, so I woke up the next morning after I found out the place where he dropped me off. The guy was a pimp. And then she started crying and, and telling me her story. And I said, well, don't you have family? <laughs> this is what she said. I said, don't you have family or anybody that could help you? You're only 19. And you're going through all this. She goes, yeah, I have family, but they're playing the tough love right now. I go, what does that mean? I know what it meant. She goes, they're playing the tough love with me right now. And I go, wow. I go, how long has that been going on? She goes, like around two, like almost three years. I started telling her about going to the home. She clutched that little puppy that she had. And she says, could I take him with me? He's the only person that has been there for me. He's the only one that has been there for me these last three years. And crying and saying, would I be able to take him? Because I can't depart from him. Thank God he did not judge us. You know, I'm the terrible person. I'm, I judge. I got like Bad habit. Bad habit. I hate it. But, you know, I learned a little bit when, when we went to run the women's home. 
And I didn't want to run the women's home. When the pastor's wife came and my wife came all excited, oh, we want you to run the women's home. And, I, and I, God spoke to us. And, I, and yeah, and I, I'll talk to you when we get home, Liz. <laughs> we got home and I said, I ain't running no women's home. I said, I grew up with eight sisters, and that's the reason why I was never home, and I ain't running no women's home. To make a long story short, we ran the women's home for five years. <laughs> but you know, in that women's home, I, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about how the devil could ravish a person's life. I learned a lot about a person who has been beat down almost since birth to adulthood could learn how to get a hold of God and hate the devil. I don't think, I never seen nobody hate the devil as much as the women in the women's home. <laughs> Boy, they hate the devil, man. The devil has taken a lot from them. Devil took away their children. Devil took away their dignity. Devil took away their self-respect. Devil took away so much from them. And then once they find out who was the one behind all that, boy, they know how to hate the devil. You know, it was during that time period that we used to get, I don't know if it's politically, politically correct or not, but this was the 90s. And we used to let, get women that they call themselves lesbians. Right? I don't know they still call it like that. There's so many rules now, I can't keep up with it. <laughs> I just can't. But anyways, this is what they said they were. And we always had a few, all the time, a batch. You know, and, and, and some of them looked like boys. Some of them looked like boys. Long shorts, big socks, tennis shoes, muscle shirt, short hair. Some of them you couldn't really tell. If they were, they weren't. And you know, being in the women's home with 25 sisters, after a while, you start like hungering for some male fellowship, right? I was like, like, like Spider-Man in the Spider-Verse. You know when, I don't know if you know what that is, I like Spider-Man movies. So in the Spider-Verse movie, there's a lot of other Spider-Mans, right? There's an old school black and white Spider-Man. There's a pig Spider-Man, which I didn't get that, but there's a pig Spider-Man. There's a girl. But every time Spider-Man met up with one of them, his spider senses would tingle, and he would look at him and say, you're like me. <laughs> and you know, I was hurting so much for male fellowship when them sisters would come in looking like brothers. I would be like, hey, you're like me. I would get all happy, but I finally found somebody I could fellowship with, man. And I started hanging around with them, and, and one of them came one day and said, Hey, so what's your name? I go, my name is, you call me Brother Everett. She goes, Brother Eric? I go, no, not Brother Eric, Brother Everett. She goes, oh, Brother Edwin? No, man, Everett. She goes, is it all right if I just call you Brother E? So yeah, I call me Brother E. And from that moment on, I was known as Brother E, right? One day, this same girl come out when we were out, we were hanging around, and she goes, hey, Brother E, can I borrow some boxers? <laughs> I started looking around, man. I said, huh? Did I hear her? I said, huh? She goes, I said, can I borrow some boxers? I thought about it. You kind of like wanted to say, yeah, but I go, no, that's going too far, man. I said, <laughs> I go, man, let, come on, let's go work on the car. <laughs> hey, I was ready for fellowship, man. <laughs> but you know what ended up happening is that if word got around and I ended up getting called. How you know when you get called? And they said, man, what are you doing over there? You know, you're supposed to be teaching these women how to be women of God. And you're over there, you know, hanging around with them. And I go, man, I was ready for fellowship, man. All that. <laughs> so I had to give them to my wife and let her disciple them. 
And they start learning and finding out that I would say 100% of the women that came in with that background had some of the saddest stories that you would ever hear of how they grew up. They grew up in some of the worst conditions that a person would have to grow up in. And so they start learning. They start learning how, how to be women. They even start learning how to dress like women. They would come and, and they would put makeup on them and they never put makeup on. They never ever wore a dress in their whole life. So they would come, sometimes Liz would dress them all up and goes, hey, you know, Diane wants you to see how she looks, you know, like a girl now. And so she would come out, batting her eyes, messing around, right? Like, <laughs> and then I would, look, I would look and say, okay, but why does she have combo, combat boots on still? It was a dress. She goes, I ain't know how to walk in those things yet that these girls walk in. <laughs> little by little, little by little, little by little, you see these women come in and you see the, the hardness break. You see the, the walls come down. You see the chains that, that comes inside of them. And you see God doing a work in them. And even one girl, that one of those girls took us to her house. And my mom wants to cook for everybody. And we went. And I tell you, when I went in that house, I'll never forget it. It was like a who's who from Juvenile Hall to San Quentin. All the walls were full of pictures all the way around of every single child and grandchild. And none of them were high school graduation pictures. None of them were elementary, junior. All of them were pictures from Juvenile Hall to the, all girls and guys every age you could imagine and think of. Like, wow. I ain't even exaggerating. I, it was like a museum. This one's in for murder. This one's in for murder. This one's getting on. There were some of them there, you know. Little kids. Little kids. You know, when we look at the world today. You know, hope is not just a one-time deal. It's hope for the ages, amen? It's hope for us. Sometimes even as Christians, it's, it's frustrating. It's frustrating in this world that we live in. You can't even watch the news. You watch the news for three days and forget about it, man. You need Tylenol, you need a psychiatrist, you need a you need a break, you need a vacation, you need to go running, you need to do something. It's so bleak. Everything on the news, all bad, all negative. You look around in all your cities that we're growing up in, and you can tell that, sure enough, there's been a, 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 a severe increase of homelessness. Homelessness everywhere. Everywhere you go now, places where there was never homelessness, now there's homeless. And there are a lot of young people, a lot of young kids being homeless, and they live down the street. Been two years walking back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Many of them hooked on heroin and methamphetamine, starting little homeless gangs. It's increased in the whole country up to 12%, and in the LA County, 17% increase of homelessness. Some of those things are depressing. They're staggering. I think it was uh, uh, Pastor, uh, uh, not Brian, uh, Pastor from the MTC, Barry. Pastor Barry, when not too long ago, he gave us a statistic of 70,000 overdoses a year in our country. 70,000 a year overdoses. That's more than all those soldiers that gave their lives in a 10-year Vietnam War. 70,000 in just one year of our kids dying overdoses in this country. More and more you're seeing mothers that 
there's some reason they're not willing or able to care for their children and they're just going off into the world and leaving their children for someone else to raise them. Some of these things are overwhelming. You see more and more children that are being diagnosed with different kinds of autisms and chemical imbalances and mental disorders at an alarming rate. At an alarming rate. That means that I would venture to say that every family, either it's in your immediate family or your brother or your sister or your neighbor or your aunt or your uncle, where you're seeing these types of things. Thank God for those that are trying to understand these different diseases that our children are being born with and, and helping them, but, but it ain't easy. It ain't easy for a single mother, a single father to have to deal with these kinds of different situations. It ain't easy for mothers and, and fathers to have to worry about whether their son or daughter is going to be the next statistic on that 70,000 a year overdoses. Many parents are going to the, the Narcan and the and Naloxin and, and they're keeping doses of, of these different kinds of medications in case their son or their daughter's overdose in their house, they give them a shot of it and get them out of it. It's available to the public now and many families are taking advantage of it. This is the world we're living in where mothers and fathers have to literally hope that their children overdose at home and not somewhere else so they could bring them out of it. All of our officers carry that around with them and they go to houses and homes and when there's overdoses, they're saving lives. But the numbers are so high, we're not, we're not reaching it. In the Old Testament, kings and prophets were set apart to do the work of the Lord. They were anointed with oil. And this oil was made with various substances, a mixture, if you will. And it was forbidden for anybody to imitate this process, to imitate this process, these oils that were mixed. So these kings and these prophets were called the Lord's anointed. And they would come, and, and the prophet would anoint them from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. He would pour this oil mixture upon them. And from that moment on, they were anointed and empowered to do the work of God. Now, Jesus was never set apart in this manner. He was never anointed with a mixture of oils upon his head to do God's work. But he was the anointed by his father in heaven called by God. He was sent from above with a greater anointing, with a greater power that no man or any other being could duplicate. It was only by his anointing that God had put upon him that he had preached when the spirit of God was upon him. And he said, God has anointed me to set the captive free. God has anointed me to set at liberty. God has anointed me to heal the sick. God has anointed me to raise the dead. And that's the message he came with, the message of power and, and of hope and of, and of love and of anointing of God, no matter the difficulties, that we don't have to be people that are so frustrated that we don't know what to do in this world, but that we can know that there is a God that has been sent with the anointing that is able to do what man cannot do. Hey, sometimes the hope that we have, the light that we have, being that we are the light of the world, you're the light in your family, sir. You're the light in your family, ma'am. You're the light in your family, young person. You're the light in your family, guy in the home. You're the light in your family. Sometimes that light doesn't shine as bright as we would want it to, but as long as it's flickering, the anointed one is able to give us the hope and and able to give us the energy, the power to continue to be that light in our families. Yeah. 
I'm going to close with this. We have the answer. Amen? We have the answer. It's not up to us to decide who gets healed and who gets delivered. All we have to know is that God loves us. All we have to know is that God cares about our families. All we have to know is that God cares about the drug addict. All we have to know is that God cares about the prostitute. All we have to know is that God cares about the hurting mother. All we have to know is that God cares about us when we're fighting this battle. And sometimes the light seems to shine a little bit dimmer. I was blessed, you know, I, I got to see one of my nephews that I hadn't seen for a long time. Hadn't seen for a long time. My mom was sick, so I seen a lot of family that I don't normally see. And he had autism, born. And his mother and, and my mother were determined that this kid was just going to go to regular school and do his thing, and that's what he did. When I seen him, he was a teenager, eighth grader, ninth grader. And I was like so impressed. He had a nice, cool hairdo. He was dressed real sharp. He's a guy that he's uh, into arts. He's teaching himself how to play different instruments. He's teaching himself how to mix things up on the thing. He's helping other people. He goes to a regular high school. He's been bullied most of his life. And he said, but you know what? I'm on a mission to help other kids that are being bullied by other kids. I'm on a mission to be example to my cousins that are going through some of the same things I'm going through. And he just blew me away. I was so impressed by this guy. I was so blessed by him. And you know, there's a beautiful story here, and we're going to close with this in John chapter 11, of how God is able to bring hope to families. It's a beautiful rendition of how God loves families. How many know God loves families? How many know God loves your family? How many know God loves your family? Hey, we're the light in our families. We got to do whatever we can do to make sure that the hope and the light of Jesus Christ shines in our families. I've been given the privilege of taking two of my grandchildren to school twice. Twice a week. At first I was like, ah, oh, come on. I'm the grandpa. I shouldn't have to be doing these duties. But there's no one else. So, you know, so I take them, twins, they're twins, boy and girl. I take them twice a week to school. But I'm looking at them, they're five years old, and I'm thinking, man, I don't really know these kids that good, man. I want to give them something. I want to give them something of the Lord in their lives. You know, I'm like, so I always tell them, and, and, I, and I told my wife one day, I said, you know what? I think the twins are Catholic. <laughs> she goes, what do you mean? I, That's cool. I grew up Catholic, so man, they reverence God and everything, so I'm cool with it. But I said, man, but I think they're Catholic. She goes, why? I go, because every time I want to ask them for prayer, like I said, let's pray for our food. And the little girl, all of a sudden, she breaks out. Our Father who art in heaven, how low be And the little boy just reverences like he's unworthy to pray the prayer. And I get him in the car and I said, okay, we're going to pray for traveling mercies. Let me pray, Grandpa. Let me pray. Okay, you go ahead and pray. Our Father who art in heaven. And the little boy, same thing, reverence next to her. I want them to know that God loves them. I want them to know that that's cool, you reverence God, but let's pray that today that God is going to be with you guys at school and that you're going to have fun. There she goes, our father. Who are... <laughs> Little boy right there in reverence. I'm thinking to myself, why does he ever get to pray? I guess she's the holy one, but... <laughs> one day they were in the living room, and I said, man, I'm going to do something... So I ran in there, and I started going, he gives me love, love, love. You know, I started trying to do that, love, 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 jumping up and down. They looked at me all crazy, and they both jumped up, and they started going, love, love, love. And they started doing some, like, weird, like, he even had a name for whatever this was up here. And I'm doing it like dorky old man style, but they went full on Michael Jackson on me. 
And they started doing some kind of horse gallop dance. It looked pretty cool because they weren't moving, but they were doing a dance. And they were going, love, love, love. And I just let them do it for a while because, man, I could swear I felt the anointing of the Holy Spirit in that room. And then after I said, okay, that's enough love. That's enough love. But you know what we're finding out? Is that people want help. People want help. We need help. Frankly, when we look at the situation, we can't do it on our own. It's impossible. We can't do it without God. Here in chapter 11 of John, we're going to go through it really quick. And look what it says. Now, a certain man was sick. Now, isn't that awesome how God just pinpoints you? He doesn't just say a man or some dude, but he says a certain man. A certain man, a special man, an individual man. A man that I created, a man that I love, a man that I'm going to die on the cross for, a man that I'm going to anoint with the Holy Spirit. This man was sick. Is there a man that you love? Is there a woman that you love that may be sick tonight? And then he even goes and takes it a step further and says, Lazarus was his name, and he lived in Bethany. Not only was he a certain man, but he was a man that had a name. You know that God knows your name? You know that God knows what city you live in, what block you live in? God knows your address. God knows who lives inside of your house. God knows what color your eyes are. He was a certain man. He had a name, and he lived in Bethlehem. God knows where you live, the town. He lived in Bethany, the town of Mary and his sister Martha. God even knew who his sisters were. God knows who your family is. God knows the names of every loved one that you've been praying for. God knows the sicknesses that they might find themselves in whether it might be addiction, whether it might be some kind of illness, you're not alone. God knows you're a certain man. God knows you're a certain woman. God knows you have certain issues. God knows you have certain things in your family that you've been praying for. And he said this was the town of Mary and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary. Oh, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair whose brother Lazarus was sick God knows what you have done God hasn't forgotten you God knows where you've been therefore the sisters sent to him saying Lord behold He whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not to death, but for the glory of God. I'm going to have the musicians come. That the Son of God may be glorified through it. How? How can God be glorified? through some of the things that you might be going through today or your family. How can God be glorified through some of these things? I I brought one of my granddaughters here tonight and she was born with some Down syndrome. And I used to look at little babies with Down syndrome and just 
Look at them and say, they all just look the same, and I didn't think much of it. Come to find out that them uh, Down syndrome children are born with many other difficulties. And my granddaughter had to have a major heart sur surgery. She's two now, at six months old. Prior to that surgery, she had caught pneumonia during that period of about a year or so ago when healthy people were dying of that pneumonia. It hit hard around here. She caught it right before she was going to have her surgery. There she was fighting for her life in the hospital with pneumonia. Three weeks. Three weeks. She couldn't breathe already. That's why she had to have the heart surgery. But there she was also with pneumonia, fighting, breathing, fighting. By the miracle of God, she came out of it. A, a few little months later, she ended up having... I was more worried about the surgery than the heart surgery. Even though it was a major heart surgery, she had to get it sewed up in two different spots. And After she had the heart surgery, I remember seeing her, you know how they are, all tubed up and everything. And the strangest thing, I shared this with Pastor Joe, and I said, man, the strangest thing occurred to me. When I looked at her, fighting and such a, like a hero to me, but when I looked at her, I said, man, with all those tubes and everything she's been through, and I go, she looked perfect to me. I don't know how she could look perfect, but she looked perfect. How does God get glory out of your situation? Sometimes we don't know. But to him, he's perfect. To him, you're perfect. Stand with me tonight. <laughs>